Would you pray with me? Wondrous God, we give thanks to you this day that we might come into your presence, that you do lead us along the pathway to that water that will sustain and encourage us. We pray this day that we would be blessed as we watch for you in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah called out to the exiles who were living in Babylon, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Then come and drink and eat freely, for the gift of God is one of grace, and it alone will satisfy. As we continue our Lenten journey, the word we hear from the psalmist this morning, as we shared in that responsive reading of the psalm, echoes the words of Isaiah. The psalm is said to come from David as he was in the wilderness or the desert of Judah, both Isaiah and David speak of hunger and thirst. The question then becomes, for what do you hunger and what do you thirst? Is it physical or is it spiritual? The fact is that we experience both the physical and the spiritual forms of thirst at some point in our lives. It is who we are. And both are real, and both lead to a need for satisfaction. So in one way or another, we seek because we thirst and we hunger. And in both physical and in spiritual cases, God ultimately is the source of satisfaction. This morning, we, as we ponder the words of the psalm, we're invited to consider what it means to be truly thirsty. As we consider what this means, the words of Jesus might come to mind as he is on the cross. We're not quite there at Good Friday yet, but when we gather on Good Friday, we will hear one of the words from the cross, and that word is, I thirst. That thirst that Jesus experienced was both physical and spiritual, the ordeal that had taken place at, after Jesus gathered with his disciples for that last supper led to the cross. And in that in-between time, he had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. And now he is on the cross and he would be de dehydrated. So there is truly a physical thirst that Jesus is experiencing. And that physical thirst leads to Jesus crying out, I thirst. But there was another kind of thirst. Now, the first one, the words, I thirst, come from the Gospel of John. But in the Gospel of Mark, we hear Jesus on the cross cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words speak to the spiritual thirst, the spiritual hunger that Jesus was experiencing at that moment. The paradox of Good Friday is that the one who offered the Samaritan woman living water the water that would quench thirst forever was now in need of refreshment. His soul thirsts for God as he suffers on the cross, feeling abandoned both by humanity and by God. We're not quite yet at Good Friday. We're on the pathway that will lead there, but we're not there yet. But Jesus' own thirst takes us back to the desert, where David is crying out, Oh God, you are my God, I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. It is said that David wrote Psalm 63 while fleeing into the desert, while being pursued by his son Absalom, who has tried to overthrow his father, take the throne. And David had no place to go except into the desert. And the Judean desert is hot. It's dry. It's barren. 
It's a foreboding place. So no wonder David is thirsty. And yet he expresses faith in God who, in the psalm, we hear David's cry out, Your steadfast love is better than life. If you've been to the desert and you you can sympathize with David, and you don't have to go to Israel to experience what David experienced, we have plenty of deserts in the United States. When Brett and I traveled to California, we crossed several deserts, including the Mojave Desert. Now, we made it across the desert without any problem. The car made it, no problems. Brett was concerned, but it didn't break down in the middle of the desert. But as you look out and you can see that desert, well, you can, you, I was reminded of what a desert looks like, what a dry and weary land, what it might look like. So when I was doing, preparing, that came to mind, those deserts that we crossed. I even have pictures of the desert, if you need to see, if you've never been there. If you've only been to Michigan and all the water that we have, you know, you, you, you need to get to the desert. Just telling you. So if this is David's song, then we would know that he would experience physical thirst. But the psalm takes us beyond the physical to the spiritual. It offers us a strong word of assurance and comfort. It embraces God's steadfast love. It leads to the praise of God. Now, if there's three verses at the end of Psalm 63 that got omitted in the reading for this morning. The lectionary omitted them. They, they're not as positive as the previous eight verses. So you can understand why the creators of the lectionary may have left them out. But they give us a sense of why David, what David was feeling when he was fleeing for his life. We hear him praying that his opponents, and those opponents included his own son Absalom, would face the power of the sword and be prey for the jackals. And the psalm ends with these words, But the king shall rejoice in God, the king being David, all who swear by him shall exult, that's all his allies, but for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Those are, that's the final line of the psalm. Again, you can understand why the lectionary creators omitted those words. But if we're honest with ourselves, we've all felt that way at some point in our life. When we faced opposition, we want our enemies to suffer, right? Anybody disagree with that? You ever felt that way? You know, there are people who have stood against you or whatever, and they deserve to suffer. Right? Now, I know you're all spiritual people, and you would never think that way. But I have. <laughs> and so it's understandable why David would feel that way and why those words might appear in the psalm. It's just kind of interesting that they're, that's the way the psalm closes. Now, I mentioned the, these omitted words for your consideration so that you can kind of think about what David might be feeling. But I'm going to stick with the, the words that were in the, the lectionary, which are a little more positive, that are, express the psalmist's sense of trust and hope in God, even in the midst of difficulties. And so the verse 8 closes with the words, My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So if we return to, these, to the psalm and, and we've heard that closing words of this, what we read, and then return to the very beginning, to the opening words of the psalm, we hear words that fit well with the season of Lent. The psalmist calls out again, Oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. And if we were to turn to Isaiah 55, we will hear Isaiah responding to that invitation, that desire, offering the invitation to everyone who thirsts that they would come to the waters. Come to the waters 
and be satisfied. When it comes to spiritual thirst, we, are we not like the deer mentioned in our opening song? The song is based on the opening lines of Psalm 42. And with this song, we make melody before the Lord, singing, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire. I long to worship you. I long to worship you. Is that what our heart says to us? What is it that our souls long for? What is the nature of our thirst? St. Augustine suggests that we all thirst for something. He calls this the thirst of the soul. The thirst of the soul is deeply embedded in our very being. And apparently there is something built into us that seeks satisfaction. Here is what Augustine wrote about his thirst of the soul, this thirst of the soul in his exposition on the Psalms. And I'll let you know that the, the translation is an older, dated translation of these words of Augustine. I'm cheap. When you can download it for 99 cents, you know what you get. So if it sounds a little outdated, that's fine, because the words that we hear are helpful. Augustine writes, And see ye what longings there are in the hearts of men. One longeth for gold, another longeth for silver, Another longeth for possessions, another inheritance, another abundance of money, another many herds, another a wife, another honors, another sons. Ye see those longings, how they are in the hearts of men, and here's the key point. All men are inflamed with longing, and scarce is found one to say, My soul hath thirsted for thee. For men thirst for the world, and perceive not themselves to be in the desert of Idumea, where their souls ought to thirst for God. Again, the language is a bit dated, but I think the message is clear. We have this thirst. It's part of who we are. And we will try to satisfy that thirst. <clears throat> the question is, where will we go to satisfy it? Will it be inheritance, money, herds, sons? Sons were important back then where that will be the place we look? Or will we look to God to satisfy the thirst? Or will we keep looking for love in all the wrong places? Why do we have this thirst, which we try to fill in a variety of ways? Augustine offers us another answer to that question in his confessions. This m memoir of his spiritual journey provides some words that many of us may have heard at some point in our lives. Augustine addresses God and says this, You stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Our hearts are restless until it rests in you. It is this restlessness that Augustine speaks of, I believe, that accounts for the continuing presence of religion and spirituality in the modern age. Science was supposed to do away with religion. But even in places like China and Russia, which were 
officially atheist for decades, religion and spirituality persists. In fact, from all reports, it's getting stronger. It persists, I believe, because our souls thirst for God. There is this restlessness that will only ultimately be fulfilled when it rests in God. And it persists even when we don't look to God to satisfy that thirst. In this psalm, David follows his thirst into the sanctuary of God, where he beholds God's power and glory. Because of God's steadfast love, which David says is better than life, he gives praise to God. So if we respond to the invitation of God, we can join David in the sanctuary, declaring, I will bless you as long as I live. And I'll lift up my hands and call on your name. In other words, our thirst for God will lead us into worship. And as we worship God, we discover our source of hope. And then we can declare with open hearts, My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. And when we do so, once again, we have an opportunity to share in singing a song of assurance. And you know, there's times and places in life where we need that assurance. Amanda Bankheisen writes something that I found helpful in trying to put all, pull this all together and how it affects the way we live in the world which we do, helping us get a handle on what the, the psalm is designed to do. She writes, Psalm 63 functions as a counter-liturgy to the liturgy of consumer capitalism. I don't know how often we think of consumer capitalism being a liturgy as a, as a way that we worship in the world, but we do. And the psalm offers us a counter-liturgy to that. And then she continues, this psalm schooling, is schooling our hearts in the things of God so that, that what we long for, what we seek, what we desire is not more of the world, but more of God. While the whole book of Psalms is meant to disciple us in an alternative set of values, expectations, and practices that reflect God's heart for the world, this psalm is the most explicit about directing our desire away from the things of the world, all those things that Augustine mentioned, and toward the things of God. We all have a thirst. There's a restlessness in every one of our hearts. The question is, where will we turn to find satisfaction for that thirst? Will we find ourselves among those whom Augustine says, thirst for the world and perceive not themselves to be in the desert of Idumea, where their souls ought to thirst for God? Will we answer the call issued by Isaiah? O oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Yes, will we say yes to Jesus' offer of living water so that we might not thirst again? <laughs>